Labs is a co-working space for tech startups. It's a not-for-profit. And uh, I, I'm lucky enough to work at Fishburners. Um, so we share the co-working space down on level two. Um, and there's currently two of us, and we're growing our team to four. That's the life of a startup. Um, I thought I'd start by acknowledging country. I worked for 20 years in the corporate sector, and it's been such a privilege to now work in the not-for-profit sector and show the respect that we have to uh, our indigenous population. So I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal people who may be in the room today. Um, it is amazing country that we have and it is thanks to the, um, the, the, the fact that those, the Indigenous people have looked after our country so well that we get to share it with them. Um, as I said, my name's John, I work at Radiant and I'll talk a little bit about Radiant and then I'll introduce you to Belinda. Um, Radiant is a tech startup looking to connect people seeking support for mental ill health with professionals, um, whether they be psychologists or counsellors. We're trying to reduce that, make it a better fit, trying to um, have a better connection. Almost somebody said the other day, we're a bit like a dating agency for, uh, for mental health organisations. Um, the important thing is that when you look at the stats, half of the population in Australia at some point in their life will experience mental ill health. Um, one in five people will um, have an experience of mental ill health in the next 12 months. And today being Are You OK Day, it's really important that we are open to, to those experiences and support our friends and loved ones through that experience. And that's what we hope to share with you today. And Belinda's gonna to talk to giving you some skills in how to have that conversation. Um, there are three main barriers um, around mental ill health. Does anybody else work in the mental health sector here? A few on that, <laughs> oh good. Um, so there's three main barriers uh, to working in mental health, health um, to in the mental health sector about helping people go through these experiences. The f and um, the first one is stigma. Um, that people feel that they can't reach out because they see the negative publicity in the media. They don't understand that it's a, it's a fact in almost everybody's life. Um, and because of that, they're not willing to reach out. So stigma is a real issue and there are many organisations like Are You OK doing an amazing job to raise awareness and raise positive um, perceptions of mental health. The second one is services. There's a range of different services and I won't go into to detail about the different areas, uh, both private and public um, and, uh, and also when they're in crisis. For example, Lifeline is a good, uh, an amazing service if people are in crisis. For me though, I think it's really important that you get, uh, you take mental ill health like you do physical health, that it's an ongoing process that everybody should incorporate into their life, not just in moments of crisis. Um, and you should build in that support, whether that support network and those healthy activities into it. And that includes eating healthily. Um, some people meditate to help get the right space um, in their mind. But there's a range of other things that you can do to take care of your mental health. The last one is when you really need it. Sometimes these conversations become too difficult, um, too difficult to share with your, your loved one or your partner, or too difficult to share with friends, and sometimes you do need to reach out to professional support, and that is what Radiant will help you do. Um, we're lucky enough at Radiant that we're supported and funded by Relationships Australia. Relationships Australia is one of the leading organisations that deal with more family relationship problems. Mental health and uh, relationships are often very tied. Um, some people who are experiencing mental ill health also have some challenges with their relationship. Um, so we are lucky enough that we've reached out into our, uh, our big sister network and found Belinda, who's a registered trainer, in uh, what's called accidental counsellor. And that is the point at which you find yourself in a difficult conversation that you may not have been aware, aware of, uh, where somebody walks up to you and says, I'm not OK. And so Belinda's going to explain to us today um, some of those tips and how to go through that conversation. Belinda herself is a professional counsellor and she's also a professional mediator. 
She's been working at Relationships Australia for seven years and before then worked uh, extensively with Lifeline. She, she's a guru in this space. So do feel to ask Belinda any questions. Um, I'll, we'll stop. I, I have found the word accidental counsellor a difficult word for me. Um, for me, I, I think it's more about the words opportunistic listening. And, uh, and so I, I like to just shift the words a little bit. But I'll pass you over to Belinda. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, as described, I have the great privilege of travelling all around New South Wales presenting accidental counsellors to schools um, and, and different other debriefing for managers, lots of different programs that are run by RA. I work three days a week as a family dispute resolution practitioner, working with separated families to get agreements around their children. So obviously I can work with people that are in high complex situations, quite often in high conflict and um, quite often child protection and drug and alcohol and mental health issues. Um, but then I also have the luxury to be able to do this and I have been able to travel all around Australia, out to the country, all, all up and down the coast. And I must admit I can talk about accidental counsellor to the end of, because I'm so passionate about it, however the microphone makes me really, really nervous. So just please be patient with me about the microphone. So um, yeah, thank you everyone for taking the time out today, particularly on Are You OK Day, as you can see in, in the, I thought it was really appropriate to wear this top. Interestingly enough, I met with RUOK, um, some RUOK members many years ago where they were realised, they, they said that the feedback that they were getting is that people were un uncomfortable asking that question because they actually didn't know what to do with the response. And that's not uncommon, even as I um, work with people all around New South Wales, that is that actual response of what do you do if someone says, no, I'm not? Or if you actually, your gut feeling is telling you really different to what they're actually presenting. Particularly when you're in an office environment, you've got your team, your family and friends and things like that around you. Now, everywhere I go, I do find that there is a wealth of knowledge within the room. So, um, unfortunately today, um, this course is actually what I normally present um, with a minimum of sort of three and a half hours is pushing it um, quite often as a full day. So, you can imagine I'm just squishing the, some really key points into one hour um, just to give you guys a bit of a taste um, of what we actually do when we present Accidental Counselor. So, interestingly enough, and I'm just going to, if anyone's happy to shout out, in 2017, Mission Australia did one of the largest youth surveys in Australia, um, where they surveyed about 20,000 um, 15 to 17 year olds um, and asked them quite, um, quite a, got a great big um, interesting feedback from them on a range of different things. So if you think about 15 to 17 year olds, what do you think they put as what they're most extremely concerned or very concerned by? Friends? Friendships? What was that? Followers. What? Followers. followers, yeah, how many likes, how many followers, how many Instagram, well, you can't tell off Instagram now, but you know, back then they could. Okay, so interestingly enough, 45.3% of these youth said that they're either extremely concerned or very concerned with their ability to cope with stress. Are they too stressed? Are they not stressed enough? Are their friends more stressed than them? So whilst we're, we're out there trying to normalise mental health and really get at a topic of conversation, then actually what we're finding is our youth are really preoccupied with what that means and what does it look like. So interesting enough, it's having a very um, well, different effect, you know, whilst that's good that it's a topic of conversation, if they're preoccupied or extremely concerned or very concerned by that. Um, what I'll do, I won't go through all the different ones, um, but, you know, if you sort of stereotype that sort of age, you'd sort of put drugs and alcohol up there, they're actually the bottom two. So they're not actually worried about them. Social acceptance, which normally comes up, is actually down... Bullying, is it 15%? Personal safety, 15 Body image, 31 So I'll leave it up here. So feel free to come and have a look because it's really fascinating um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so as we were saying earlier, is that one in five um, Australian workers have, um, will experience a mental health issue and 45% of Australians will experience it throughout their life. What do you think are the two most common diagnoses of mental health in Australia? Anxiety, yep, that's one of them. Depression, yep. And the third one, which is normally the hardest? Stress, personality disorder, actually addiction. So addiction is the third most common mental health problem uh, in Australia. So if we look at um, anxiety and depression, the way I sort of it can explain anxiety and depression, depression 
um, is a very much an internal feeling. You know, this feeling of doom, this feeling of no hope, I'm useless, I, I, I can't see. You know, if Lifeline describe it as not being able to see a light through the dark, um, quite often they will retract from life, um, they will isolate themselves, they won't engage in things. They're normal coping skills. So if you actually look at a lot of people, they've had this quite a long time in their life, so they've created coping skills around these things. Whereas anxiety is an external feeling. So the world thinks I'm crazy, everyone thinks I'm insane. Um, that sense of overwhelmness is an anxiety, is how they describe anxiety. So they're the two most common ones that we find um, that are diagnosed within Australia. So when I um, go out to, to present all over Australia, um, and I went out to Gilgandra and Coonamble, I'm about to go out there again in about three more weeks. I, um, I went out there with a really open mind. They're very much drought affected. A lot of the people in the room were the people representing the buyer bay or, or the local hairdressers or the doctors. Um, there was even the local vets who, um, you know, broke down halfway through the, the through my um, my course, um, just from the stress of actually having to manage people's emotions. And we're talking about mental health and how people see mental health. Interestingly enough, when I put up this slide and I said, you know about people recognising they have a mental health. One of these beautiful gentlemen in the audience said, I would never ever tell anyone if I wasn't feeling well. And I was like, why is that? You know, tell, tell us more about that. He said, because you'd take my guns off me. And I said, oh, okay, tell me more about that. And he said, as a man, as an, a farmer in Australia, if I went to my doctor and said that I wasn't feeling well, you'd immediately remove my guns. And they're part of my identity, they're part of who I am. And, and how could you immediately make that assumption? And I was like, I'm so fascinated by that response because as someone who works in this area, statistically we know that if you're having you know, depressive thoughts or you're not feeling well, having great mental health, that statistically you're more at risk if you have access to weapons. So as a duty of care, we remove them. But actually that then avoids them people reporting or actually connecting to people around them. And that's just one take from the country. And as I go around, you know, people that have worked for the police force are the same. They will be, um, their guns will be taken until they see a certain amount of counsellors or psychologists, people in security as well. So it's around this, um, this flow on effect around people making connections and how they actually identify mental health with themselves and how they see themselves. So this up here is actually um, taken from a Canadian and American armed forces um, uh, Defence Forces, um, psychiatric department. So they, on um, a lot of um, research and uh, around people returning from war and um, different parts in the military, they realised that people were not wanting to say that they were having any trauma because they felt that it was a diagnosis that would actually stay with them for the rest of their lives. And whilst there are some chronic, there are some chronic diagnoses that people have to manage. However, the research actually came back that every single one of us works is not um, static in our mental health, we're actually all on a continuum. And where we sit in that is somewhere between healthy, reactive, injured and ill. And on a daily basis, we can all, some people say, when I work with people, ask them where they sit and they go, oh, ask me in a few more minutes, I might be sitting somewhere else. So again, you know, for us to assume that if you wake up in a certain mood, that that's the, you know, the outcome of your day, that's not actually people's experiences. People really flow through this throughout their day, whether you have a diagnosis or not. You know, this is our daily reaction to mental health struggles and things that we're dealing with um, throughout our, our, our life and our day and, and our different things. If we look at um, what we classify as life little road bumps, some of those things um, could be social acceptance, school issues, work issues, parental pressure, family pressure, family conflict and change. And um, one thing also with your ability to cope with mental health and change is your, um, is your attachment and independence. There's a lot of research actually around there that says that this is established in your first thousand days of life and that's from conception. So that attachment that you have with your primary carer is actually how you then manage things moving forward. So that's also your ability for resilience and moving through things and also any sort of trauma or grief or loss. Um, that you could have that could affect, you know, quite often when I'm presenting any of these sort of courses, there's things that are triggered um, that you mightn't even be aware that are a triggering thing for you. It's uh, quite, you know, I'll be sitting in a mediation and someone will say something and I'll be like, oh, didn't even realise that would trigger me, but somehow you've really annoyed me right now. And it's that reflective ability to actually realise that that's something that's triggering you, which then affects your ability for mental health. 
So, and this is just really touching on the subjects and how it works. So if we, has anyone, um, anyone heard of Dan Siegel? Dan Siegel's Flip Your Lid, seen his TED talk. Now, Dan Siegel is a highly skilled person at presenting this and very, very talented at how he does. If anyone else is more interested, is further in wanting more information around the neurobiology of the brain response, have a look at his TED talk, um, Dan Siegel's Flip Your Lid. Um, he's very, very good at how he does it and how he presents it. But if we look at the brain, um, so this is, this is the brain. So if we were to cut my head down the middle like this, this is what we're looking at up here. So this is your executive state or your prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of your brain. Um, we then have the emotional state, which is this part that falls in the middle. And then you have your survival state, which is the bit down the bottom. Now, the way that Dan Siegel presents this is that this bit here, so the bit that comes up here, he presents it as a, he calls it his um, hand puppet or hand brain, is this part up here is this middle part, your survival part of your brain. So the bit in here, and we also call that your caveman part of your brain, your fight, flight, freeze, and they've actually put faint in there as well now. So that's that middle part of your brain. The emotional state is this bit that comes around, and then your prefrontal cortex is the bit that wraps it all in and holds it in tight, or should do that. What happens though, and an easy, uh, the way to sort of describe this is if we were to start smelling smoke now, so if this room was to fill with the, s the smoke, this part of your brain, your survival state of your brain, would start going into panic mode. Smoke, 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 there's, you know, fire, what does that mean? In 0.1 milliseconds, we'll start pumping chemicals through your body. Cortisone and adrenaline will start going through your body in a survival mode. It, it takes us back to as if we'd seen a saber-toothed tiger or, I don't know, something like that back in caveman time. This bit here, your emotional part of emotional state, starts scanning all your history. Mm, get down low and go, go, go. What does fire mean? Have I ever been in a fire? And this bit at the front, your, your reasoning or your executive state goes, come on, guys, calm down, calm down. Someone's just burnt the toast. It's all okay. Everyone back into, into line. So that's how the brain works. Now, those chemicals that are pushed through your body when you have a near miss on the road or you smell smoke or, or something like that, how long do you think it takes for your body to get back to completely normal from those? Have a guess. Four hours? Four hours? 12 to 15 hours, depending on the person. So who has ever watched like those triple zero or ambulance shows where the person's going, I'm okay, I'm okay, everything's good, everything's good. And then about 12 hours later, they're sitting in emergency and they're going, ah, my leg's gone, my leg's gone. That's because all those adrenaline and cortisone that's been pumped through your body is starting to go down and that, that ability of your brain to come back online. It, it's, it, your body does it. It's an amazing technique to actually keep you safe. But what happens to people that are constantly sitting with these in trauma or, or things that are happening through them constantly, particularly from a very young age, that they're used to sitting in this survival state of the brain. So quite what they call it, as Dan Siegel says, they flip their lid. So this reasoning or the executive state can't actually come back online to get them to be reasoning. That's where when you actually have someone and they flip their lid, you're talking to the caveman part of their brain. Does that make sense? So quite often, have you ever had a conversation with someone you think, and on reflection, you're like, that's their caveman part. They're sitting in the fight, flight, freeze mode, and I'm actually not being able to get any reasoning from them. Equally, though, when we have these conversations, you're human as well. So your lead is going to wobble as well, depending on what people say. So thinking about those sort of things um, when you're having these conversations. Now, this part, the orange part of the brain here, that's actually developed. That's the start of the spine when you're in your mum's tummy that starts you the development of your brain. So when you're stressed and you can feel it all through your body, that's because it's all connected. So it's not this sense of actually, you know, how does this all fit together? It's all tied in together. So when we're stressed physically, if anyone's willing to own up to it, how, how do you feel it? Me, I'm, I, I know because I get pains here, I must be gritting my teeth and I'm like, oh, there's a lot been going on for me lately. Anyone else? Yeah, tummy pains. That's a really common one. Heart rate goes up for you, yeah. I actually met a lady, I did this presentation not long ago, and she was in a situation um, with one of her staff members actually, um, quite a stressful situation that she didn't enjoy obviously, and she's a marathon runner, and that night when she downloaded her Fitbit, it said that she'd run a marathon that day. The that came up saying that she'd run, done something, so that's, 
really reflective. So when we talk about how it comes up in the body, it's actually, there is a reason for it. There are ways that we're doing it. So the hidden effects. So your brain gets ready for action. That's your caveman brain, getting ready for the saber-toothed tiger. So that lack of sleep, has anyone else got up at two o'clock in the morning and found something really important that actually is at seven o'clock in the morning really irrelevant? <laughs> No, somehow the other day at two o'clock in the morning, I needed to know what I was going to serve on Christmas Day. And I was like, really? I was like, come on, brain, seriously. That's stress. That's your brain getting ready for action. Um, also prevent sleep. A lot of people s seem to feel that they're more sleepy. However, it's that dream sleep. It's that deep sleep that you're not getting into. L quite often you're having the surface sleep, but not getting down into that good brain recharging sleep that you need. Adrenaline is released, that's your fight or flight, that's those chemicals that I was talking about. Um, anyone else, um, after when they're feeling really stressed, feel like they've been to the gym? Not that I really know what that feeling feels like, but that sense of like, oh, you know, my muscles are really sore. There's actually a reason for that. Your liver releases glucose and you're this, your body does all this to protect you. So that glucose is going to your muscles, which is why they get sore. So that's what, these are all signs to, to look out for around stress in yourself. The cortisol that's released makes your blood pressure go high, your blood sugar go high, and says memory and tension higher. Well, your memory and tension isn't there, so it's that height of it. You know, they say that um, people's visual um, evidence is actually useless in any sort of cases, in any sort of adrenaline situation, because we, we, our body does that to protect us. Um, your immune system goes low. Quite often we get really run down. We'll get sick, get colds and things like that. Pain sensitivity, that's that sense of like, no, I'm okay, and then all of a sudden realise that things are not great. And your serotonin, which is your happy hormone, that goes down as well. These are all to protect you. So these are all signs around stress. Also, your digestion slows. That's the tummy ache. That's the thing. So your digestion will slow oxygen, nutrients, and blood flows is going to your muscles, not to your digestion. That's where you quite often get a sick stomach. Um, and those butterflies in your stomach. These are all really, really, these are uh, uh, what our body is designed to do to protect us, but they're things to keep out an eye out for. The things that we can noticeably see, um, pupils will dilate, mouth goes dry, heart beats faster, breathing's faster and shallower, sweating when we're stressed, um, muscles tension for action, insomnia and ADD or ADHD symptoms. So when you look at, um, you know, that's why to get a diagnosis of ADD or ADHD, it should be in three parts of your life because actually the, the signs of ADD and ADHD are exactly the same of trauma. If you've seen, if you've had a lot of trauma or sit in a, lived in a high conflict situation as a child, that they will actually mimic the same sort of things because that's your body protecting you. Okay? Interesting things though, that's our body telling us what we, what we need to do to keep us safe. Um, and what stress looks like. Also, I'm just going to do this quickly because I am aware of the time, but I do find that this is um, really relevant, particularly for people working in an office environment, is that why do some people, you know, we all have these same effects, but why are some people actually able to move through things faster than other people? You know, why is it that um, some people uh, are able to bounce back or to move, move on from different events um, and see them very differently? It's not uncommon for me to meet a client and I walk out and go, oh my gosh, what an amazing person. That story's just so crazy. And they're going, yep, I'll be right. The kids are fine, you know, and they're moving on. And then someone else is an absolute, you know, cannot get it together, yet their story is, you know, nowhere near actually, you know, events on the paper. And that's people's ability to move forward. Has anyone ever heard of Kubler-Ross? The mental health people over there would have definitely heard of Kubler-Ross. Kubler-Ross has been around for a really long time. And I'll leave this up the front. I know that, that it's a little bit small for everyone to see. But this is actually a grief and change model. So a lot of people would have heard of the stages of grief. That's a Kubler-Ross model. Um, so it starts with shock, denial, frustration, depression. So it goes over here. So it starts with shock, denial, frustration, depression. This depression down here, we also call that the, um, you know, that, that's very much the neutral zone. Like a manual car, you can sit down in there, you can rev and rev and rev as much as you want but you're just gonna use lots and lots of energy. Start to experiment, decision making, and then integration. So to give you an example of what I mean by this in, in sort of an office environment, or, or to make it a little bit more realistic, is that so myself and another lady, Helen, we both present this course all over the place. Um, we were brought into a, a large government organization um, that there had been lots of changes, and we were unaware of what we were actually walking to on this day. 
However, um, they had had a lot of problems with morale within the office and so they got a new manager in. The new manager only a week before us um, on the Friday said to all the staff over the weekend she will be packing up all their desks and moving them and moving them all to sit in different spaces. These people have worked there for many, many years and there was a lot of, lot of trauma over this decision. They all came in on Monday morning to basically find where they'll be sitting. We then arrive on the Friday morning and you could really see it in the room. We're like, this is like Kubler-Ross in action, man. So you had the people over here that were going, she can't do that. There must be some sort of legal reason she can't touch my personal stuff or move it. Then you had the person going, this is ridiculous, I can't believe it. The other one, you know, there was probably two or three that were just going, oh, I'm so dumb. They were quite numb. They were like, this is just, you know, I feel anxious coming to work. I feel sick being here. This is really depressing. And then you had some go, you know, I actually don't mind my new spot. I'll get a bit more window. It's not too bad. And then you had the people in the office going, it's just a desk, get over it. <laughs> and actually for people to manage that all in one space is really hard. You know, we're all probably sitting there with that per uh, friend, you know, that's, uh, that you go to them with something and they're like, get over it. And then you're the person going, but I, I'm not, you know, or, the pers or you're that person. And this is, that's called the Kubler-Ross um, um, a model of change and everyone's different and that also comes from those things that we we're talking about before those life road bumps and their ability this is also a similar one but called the grief wheel so feel free to come up take photos of these or have a look at them at the end but why do some people then get into that wheel some people just spin and spin and spin while some deteriorate and some recover so that's also all these different things around mental health that help that uh, the struggle for people to actually move through any sort of change or issues that happen um, but I'm happy to talk about them a little bit more at the end. I'm just aware of time. So that's basically giving you around some of the, the information around why we react the way we do, how are people managing it, why, and their different responses. But actually, what can we do? What do we do with that? How do we have the conversation? So we have a few, you know, we love different sort of models and things in, it, in our um, program here. But we, we have a three-step program called Reflect, Clarify and um, Summarise. So to reflect is the first step. But to be able to reflect, you really need to listen. So there's also an acronym called the LEARN model. So it's about listen, engage, acknowledge, response and then um, turn the negative into a positive. So these are the steps that you need to do to be able to listen. Now when we say listen, um, you know, everyone's going, of course I listen, you know that's... But it's actually trying to find, to listen for the, the emotion, um, the, the, what it connects to and the motive behind it. So why do people do what they're trying to, what they are doing? Um, you know, is someone, you know, I feel sad because this happened and, and that's making me feel this way. So it's around those three steps. It's not just listening to the surface of it. It's actually trying to get into the in-depth of it. If it, there is a Chinese character, an ancient traditional Chinese character, um, that actually says to listen, I'll just grab it out um, so I get the exact. Mm. Oh, that's okay, I know it. So it's got to listen in the Chinese character has um, your eyes, your ears, you and me, and undivided attention and your heart. They're all actually in the character. All those symbols is to actually listen. And if you actually go to a really traditional one, there's a sign of a crown in it if you go way back, which means to make the person feel like they're a king, is to listen to them. So you're really trying to listen for the underlying um, emotions, um, content and motives behind what they're trying to say. So if you actually just listen to, to what they are, you'll never get anywhere. So I, I quite often use, and I'm just going to do a quick version of this, my, I use my 93-year-old grandma because there ain't no coming back from where she's, you know, exactly where she's going. So I took her to a doctor's surgery and I'm no NIDA student but I'll do a little bit of a role play um, where I took her up to reception and she thought she'd booked an hour's appointment. And she walked up to the receptionist and, and she's like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you're such an idiot. I told you clearly that I needed an hour. You've only given me 15 minutes. Do you understand my husband's had a stroke? I've had to get a carer for him, then get him here, and I've been coming here for 40 years and you give me 15 minutes? I, I can't believe that you would be so stupid. Do you not understand? Now, that poor receptionist probably had her lid flipped a little bit by being caught an idiot, but if we actually listen to Audrey around... You know, if you were to just go, well, we only do 15 minutes appointments, chances are that would have escalated. But actually to say to Audrey, 
gosh, a lot's gone on for you to come here today, hasn't it? You had to get a carer for your husband. He's not well. Then come all the way in here. You've been coming here for 40 years and find out we've only got 15 minutes available. That's a lot, isn't it? See how it's a really different response. It's actually trying to find out what the motives to the 15 minutes, you know? For that 15 minutes, is it saying that her issues of value can't be summed up in 15 minutes, the value of her as a client? You know, it's all those different things that are going on for her. So that's to truly listen to someone for what's going on for them. Now, if you actually put into Google and then click over, you guys obviously here would be way better at this than me. Um, if you click over to the little picture of images, if you put in the word listen, you can do it because I've done it, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of people sitting there like this. Apparently, if you hold your chin, you're listening really well. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> They're all like this. Now, if I was to sit here for the hour and, and talk like this, I think you'd find that really uncomfortable. But actually being really aware of lots of different things. So if, you actually, if you're wanting someone to talk, we call it feeling the back of the chair. So sit back in your chair and relax. Um, if you're a leg crosser, being really aware that if I was to present the whole presenta presentation like this, you guys have been sitting there probably squirming for a little bit of it because it's actually where your leg goes, is, is where you know, your attention's going. And you'd feel quite dismissed over there. So very rarely do we actually cross our legs or we actually look at the balance really, really carefully within the room. Uh, have you ever thought about when you have, a, if you've, any of you have got young children or you've got nieces or nephews or anything, if you have a baby and if I was to put like a cap on your skull and a cap on the baby's skull and you know when you get a baby and you go, you start poking your tongue out and they do the same thing, that's because you're connecting. That still happens as adults but how can, you can actually do it through your breathing. So sitting down, feeling the back of the chair, if someone's really quite upset or, or distressed, <sighs> Wow, slowing it down, using your pace to actually get them. And they will mimic your pace. It's quite interesting watching people. If you feel that you want to take more, um, have something to share, you move to the front of the chair. We consciously use this in a mediation space. And to control the room, you stand up. So that's the three different levels of actually trying to have that conversation. Also, for, to getting someone to be able to talk, if we have a parent that comes in that says that one of their children isn't sharing a lot, our advice to them is find something on eBay that you really need to buy as long away as possible. Because <laughs> there's something really comforting about sitting next to someone to be able to have a conversation. That's not always possible in an office environment, but it could be something like having a, um, a block meeting. You know, walking around that block and that not having the eye contact is actually something really comforting. It also puts boundaries on the conversation. So, um, you know, by having a side-by-side -side conversation, um, you'd never put your chairs, you know, I'd never do talk to a client with them directly in front of me. I'd have us both looking at a central sort of table or something like that. So these are all ways that you can set up to help have that conversation a little bit more. Even things if everyone knows about the fidget spinners, they were originally for people um, with uh, like on the spectrum, but anything like that, squishy balls. These days I, I say people tend to use, it's interesting because we do a program called Kids in Focus, which is about the impact of conflict on children. We have a really confronting video it's amazing how many people have to check their messages as soon as it gets really confronting. It's a bit like a pacifier for a lot of people. But remembering that we're all different learners. So we've got, you know, you've got your auditory and your visual, but you've also got your kinesthetic and your tactile. So having those things out, if you're having to have a conversation or you're wanting to have a conversation, doesn't mean they're not listening. Like, I'll own it. I'm that annoying person that sits next to you at a conference that makes the snake out of the minty wrapper or has to find all the pink Mentos in the really loud wrappers. That's me, I'm a tactile learner. And I, if you talk to me without anything in my hands, my brain just shuts down and goes into overload. Okay, so just thinking about those sort of things. But when we're talking about reflecting and you're actually tr trying to have the conversation with the person, reflecting what they're saying. So th there's a, a phrase called name it to tame it. So if someone's saying, no, I, I feel sad or I feel mad, tell me about that, what does sad mean? What does mad mean? Reflect back to them. Tell me more about that. One of the things that um, I was taught when I first did my training was this term, and I thought, oh, I'd never use this term. But what does that look like? You know, we know what we want or what we need, but actually what does that look like? Now, if I was to go around the room, and, and quite often, particularly when I'm talking to schools, 
you know, if I was to go around the room and say, to ask everyone to fill out a form about what friendship looks like or what does it mean to have friends, we'd all have different answers. So when you're having a conversation with someone, ask them. So when you're saying that you're lonely or that you want friends, what does it mean to have friends? What does it look like? Tell me what it looks like. Because some people might say, I want to be at every party you've ever been. And some people go, I just want someone to say hi to me in the morning. So exactly, then you know actually what you're working with and what, what's happening. So reflecting back to them. Also by using this skill, if you can do it, it feels really clunky because um, a lot of people that I teach it to go, oh, it's a bit parroty. I've never had anyone go, uh, that's what I've just said. If you do it in a, a, a way, tell me more about that. It's amazing how much people feel like you've actually heard me. The reason we also use that technique is it's from a place of safety for yourself. You're not taking that emotion on. You're not trying to work out what that emotion is. You're asking them to tell you. That's their experience and they're getting to, ex to explore it. So getting them to reflect what they're going through and, and, and talk about it by just asking them, getting them to explore more about it. Are you okay? No, I'm not. So tell me, tell me more about that. What do you mean by that you're not okay? And then people will, and, and you would do that. If in doubt, summarize. So what I hear that there's a lot going on for you. There's this and this and this, is that right? Okay, and then getting them to, to bring it back in. They're the skills that would be used in an accidental counsellor situation. And that's that clarifying. What did you mean when you said, can you say more about that? So tell me more about that. This is also then trying to work out, quite often people, you know, you can also get people to rank what's, um, what's going on for them. So what I can hear, there's a lot that's been happening, you know, your son's in trouble at school, you, you've got such a workload and your husband's not well. So out of those three, which do you think is worrying you the most? A, 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 or I can hear that you're more worried about your husband. No, 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 actually if I could just get on top of work, I think the other stuff would be okay. So it's work that you're really stressed about. So it's helping them as well clarify in their head, actually what are they preoccupied with? What are they worried about? So they're the different um, skills that you can learn, use. So, so you're listening, um, acknowledging, um, encouraging, acknowledging, and then start to replace that neutral with a positive. So I can hear there's a lot going on, but you put a lot of effort and thought into that and it sounds like you do have a plan moving forward. So getting them to, a lot of um, our clinical team call it a J curve. So you've got to go hard with someone to be able to then start seeing the positive in it. So these are just some tips that's obviously just the, the top of the sort of skills that you would use. Um, and that summarise. We, we do have a sign in our other one, if in doubt, summarise. <laughs> so if, if, you, if someone's told you a whole big bunch of stuff, don't hesitate to go, okay, gosh, there's a lot going on. Let me, let me this is what I heard you say and going back through. And, and they will check with you and they will clarify. Um, using their words is really important. If they use words you're not comfortable with, depending on the language, you could change it slightly, but check with them, is that right? Is that correct? Am I hearing you right? So it's depending on some people are not comfortable with different people's language. So you'd go back with them and, and check on that. So um, that summarising and, and going through the different options is really important. This skill is really done from a place of safety and putting the emotions back on them and helping them to explore. Also then you know what you're dealing with. You know where they're at, particularly on Are You OK Day. Um, are we talking about getting them some immediate help or are we actually just getting get them to engage with someone, someone you know, like the, the team that we have or similar um, to be able to explore these, these skills further, these issues that they have. So these are the three steps when it comes to having that conversation. So reflect, so don't hesitate to ask the question but reflect, clarify and summarise and, and, and sending it back to them. We do have some little cards up here. We have a few, but we might be able to get a few more um, seeing though there's a bit of a turnout over the next few days. These are the three skills when you're thinking about. If someone says something to you, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some situational um, uh, ways to deal with it, but this is if you're trying to have that conversation. Um, when we met with Are You OK? And I'm just aware of the time. I don't want to go too much into your break, but um, is that a lot of people have the fear around asking that question because of what happens if it's something I can't handle or I can't manage from the response? What happens if it's too big for me? There are some situations that, um, you know, that people are, are quite scared about what might happen. However, you use these exact same skills. And don't hesitate to say to someone, okay, actually, I, I don't know what to do with that. 
how about we go have a chat? We could give Lifeline a call, or if we have someone else here that would be good at that, how about we give a counsellor a call together and see if we can make an engagement? So don't, the biggest message that I can give you from all of these talks that I've ever done, in all the work that I've ever done, is that the, I can guarantee, without any research, I'd put my house on this, there is no one service that can be everything to everyone. There's so many services out there, but we all need to work in collaboration to be able to support someone. So if you have that conversation with you and they give you some really vital information, that's not up to you to fix that or change that or, 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 or keep them safe for long term. It's about you connecting them with the people that have the skills that are able to do that. That's the most vital part. So I'm just going to talk about um, some actual situations um, that might come up. Has anyone ever experienced a panic attack or seen a panic attack? Yeah. So for those that haven't, panic attack looks a little bit like this where you can't feel your diaphragm. And that's what it will look like. Quite often it looks something like that. Has the exact same symptoms as a heart attack quite often. Pain in the chest, can't feel your diaphragm, being able to only breathe up to here. If you see someone having this or you're with someone that's having a panic attack, call an ambulance. Um, get them connected with some help. Get an ambulance on the way. A standard panic attack should only last around 10 minutes. Some people do have multiple ones. However, they should be pretty much calmed down within 10 minutes. Um, the most important thing is, you know, just get them to an area that's fairly clear. It's not um, like a seizure. You don't have to worry about lying them on the side or choking or anything like that. Quite often people that have had panic attacks, ask them, do you know what's happening? And they'll say, I'm having a panic attack. Quite often they have skills around actually being able to manage that. They have different techniques that they use. Sometimes it's um, a song, sometimes it's counting, lots of different things like that. Getting them to an area where you can actually sit with them. If they're not sure what's going on, if they have a method, then obviously sit there and do that with them quietly. If they don't, then it's around counting and really emphasising on the breathe, breath out. So that's the breath that you want to over dramatised for no, word, no other better word, I guess. And you start with a three, three, three. So you breathe in for three. One, two, three. Hold for three. One, two, three. Breathing out. Then you do it for four. And you're doing it just really, really slowly, trying to get them into that pattern. Just the counting alone will help them just to refocus and you're trying to really get them to focus on that breathing. If you get them to breathe out and really emphasising around that, they'll, their body will naturally start to feel their diaphragm more because it will be taking all that oxygen out of them. Staying really, really calm and help will be on its way, um, but quite often they know what's happening. Um, it, it's not a, um, a lot of people go um, brown paper bag. Um, that again is, is more around the focusing on the breathing. Uh, the problem with the brown paper bag is they're not as accessible as they used to be. So <laughs> quite often people go, yeah, um, I haven't done my kids' lunch order in a brown paper bag since I've had kids, so I haven't even brought them and, you know, I've got three kids. So, like, I don't know how many people have them sitting around like we used to. So it's just that focusing on the counting and the breathing, okay? So don't feel like you need to have resources around you. You can actually use those skills. S sometimes also putting on some music, but continuing with the counting and over-dramatising over the breathing out. Um, another one, anyone else have anything else that's worked for them or that they know of that's happened because quite often people have some really awesome feedback of things that they have used. Yeah, a timer. Yep. And even just that focusing on a timer clicking over. Interesting, one of the um, a girl that I presented to not long ago, she said the most important thing was, um, like a nurse looked at her and said, well, you're not going to die. Like, you know, and she was like, oh, I'm not going to die. So, you know, and like it was just that reality. Some people I can imagine that wouldn't work for, but for her that worked really well. She was like, oh, well, I guess I'm not. So I've just got to focus on this sort of thing working, moving forward. Um, any, as another thing that's actually really, really common is self-harm. Um, way more common than um, I think a lot of people realise. There's YouTube channels dedicated to it. There is um, a lot of knowledge out there. It's very, very common within schools, even down to primary schools that I'm presenting at. Um, Self-harm um, self can look at lots of different things. Hitting and slapping yourself, punching yourself, um, pulling out your hair, your eyebrows and eyelashes, biting. So um, particularly biting this part of your hand. Um, which there's a lot of theory around um, tapping, um, that this could be quite therapeutic, but a lot of people biting that, biting the inside of their mouth, um, 
I had a mum once that her daughter had a lot of scarring on her shoulders from biting her shoulders, um, li um, li um, using a lighter to, to burn themselves and, and cutting girls quite often at the top of their legs, underneath their skirts and, and boys on their arms. Um, can look in lots and lots of different ways. It's very, very common out um, within the school system. Ha the research shows that self-harm is not a precursor to suicide. Um, so it's not a sign of someone that's planning to suicide or has thoughts around that. But they're quite often people that have suicide have do have a history of self-harm. So they're not directly correlated, but there is some connection with some people there. Um, interestingly enough... A lot of people seem to think that it's for, for, for attention seeking and things like that. Um, it's actually research shows and there isn't a lot of really good up to date research. The latest research we had I think was from 2008 that said, you know, um, 17 to 24 year olds, I think it was 24% of 17 to 24 year olds had, um, had self harmed at some point in their life. So I would actually say from talking to teachers that that is drastically higher. Um, and a lot more common, which I think is also reflective in that Mission Australia um, around children being able to manage self -harm, um, manage uh, uh, emotions because, you know, if you've got friends that are self-harming, where do I fit in with that? Um, it is used to manage emotions. It has the same parts of your brain as adrenaline comes up, so it's quite often people that are doing it don't realise they're doing it at the time. Um, again, normalising. If someone discloses to you, a child or an adult says to you that they're self-harming, Ask them, have you spoken to someone, have you told someone else about this? Uh, ask them to look at it. They're quite often a really, really, that's not something that we ever get a response of no, they will show you. If anything, it's around having a look at it for care. You know, I want to make sure it's not infected or anything like that. Is, do you need any other support around that? And getting them to connect. Have you got someone that you could share this with, someone that could actually, you could explore this more for and get some help around that? So that really, um, you know, whilst our... Response is to, to not act shocked or, or alarmed at any point. I, I do understand that, that that is not easy for everyone if you haven't had that experience previously, um, but that's really important to really normalise it for them. Particularly on Are You OK Day, but suicide is something that is um, really important. Um, suicide is a question that I ask regularly within my job, nearly daily. Um, I've had lots and lots of different responses to suicide. Now, when you're asking around suicide, um, I would say, have you had thoughts of harming yourself? Have you had, do you have a plan to take your life? Um, have you had thoughts of suicide? We don't use the word commit. Um, if you can, if you don't, if you do and it's, you know, it's not the, it's not the worst thing you can do. Um, the word commit has um, mental health to be committed, also means to um, a, a crime and also it means if you commit to something. So you try to really avoid that as, as part of the question. In my job, I've had many times where I've had to ask the question, uh, yes, I have had some, no, no, not that bad. I've had some, um, yeah, I have Belinda. Yep, yep, I do. Some, yes, I do, I have a plan and a time frame. And I've had, there's only one time that I've had a different answer to that. And don't mind my language, I had a client who, I can still, every time I tell this story, I picture it. It's like, John, you know, you, you've sold your house, you've paid your rent up to the end of the month, you've sold your business. And you're talking, you know, in a way that, that's making me worry about your safety. Are you having thoughts of taking your own life? And he goes, no, piss off, Belinda, I'm moving to Tasmania. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, okay, I can do that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you got somewhere to stay down there, John. As quickly as that, I, I sort of came back from that. If that's the worst answer you can get, you know, for all the times that I've asked the question, I've kept people safe, that's the worst response. Lifeline's done a lot of research around this. At no point asking that question will someone go, oh, hadn't thought of that, great idea. However, that question will keep a lot of people safe. So by asking that question does not pe make people at more risk than they were, but it's just keeping people safe. So what you're trying to do to actually, um, if someone does say yes or, or, or ha has an answer that uh, is concerned, what you're trying to do is actually find out um, you use those same skills to listen and clarify and summarise um, and then respond. What you're trying to do is find out at what point they are. Are they having thoughts of suicide um, but don't have a plan or don't have a, a way, they're just feeling that way? It would be around getting them to promise or to make a commitment or to link them to some resources, getting them to talk to someone. Um, you know, what would it be like if you're feeling like that to give Lifeline a call? Or would you feel, how about speaking to a counsellor? If they do have a, um, if they have a plan, and quite often they either have a plan or they have a plan and they've got the resources as well to do that. What would it be like now if we connected you with someone who can keep you safe? 
Um, if they, they want to, you could call an ambulance together. If they don't, you have a moral obligation. I am a mandatory reporter, but I also have a moral obligation to keep people safe. That's where you say, I, unfortunately, right now I need to keep you safe and I will call an ambulance and they can make that assessment about what's best for you. It's not about you then trying to keep them safe for that time. It's about you connecting them to people that can actually do that. Now, don't hesitate if you do ask that question and they say yes and you go, oh, your brain just goes, I don't know what to do with that. Name it and go, actually, I don't know what to do with that right now. What would it be like if we gave Lifeline a call together? What would it be like if we went down and we went and connected with someone now? So if you're feeling overwhelmed, because quite often they, prob they are feeling overwhelmed as well, don't feel like you have to be everything to them. Don't be scared by that. But the most important thing that around all of these things and the only other crisis line other than triple O in Australia is Lifeline. They're the only two crisis lines. So there's no point in giving them RA's number or, um, you know, the black dog or any of them. They're not crisis numbers. They, you need a crisis number. They're the two. What will happen if you call triple O? Um, they will come and make an assessment for them. If that they feel that they need to be taken for a further assessment, they'll be taken um, for 24 hours. Should they be at risk, it's normally a three-week plan. So it's not around, you know, it's around actually getting them connected to the right people that can actually make keep them safe and get them on the right path back to making decisions for them. Now, with everything that I've talked about today, the, the main thing to remember, if, if you take away about refer, 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 but the other thing around all the different things, you cannot ask the question around suicide. You cannot ask the question around self-harm. You cannot experience a panic attack. And even just having those questions where you sit and reflect with someone, you cannot do that without doing some self-care. Um, quite often, you know, are, okay, are you okay days about those people that you're trying to connect with? But it's also about looking after yourself. You can't be available to people if you, if you drain yourself. I can never ask that question, no matter how many times I've asked many questions, can I do without walking out and connecting with one of my team members, without going and having some supervision. And that's the same with everyone. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, they say you've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on other people. And it's really, really important that you're able to do that. Self-care is the vital part that connects all of this together. So when I talk about self-care, and I know I'm rushing through this, but I do want to just spend the last few minutes that we've got because this is the bit that tends to get tagged onto the end, but it's actually the bit that holds it all together. This is the bit that makes it able for you when you, you're sitting there with your friend or with a colleague and you're having to have these conversations, whatever that looks like around what's going in their life. If you're able to do the self-care, then you're able to do these questions and not take it home to your family. If you fill up someone else all day, you're going home to an empty person to your family and that's not okay either. So when we talk about self-care, we've got a few different things up there, you know, reflecting after the incident, talking, connecting with your peers. We have supervisors. We have um, both taped supervision and we also have face-to-face -face supervision. Um, but applying stress management techniques, um, I'll be honest, I got, we used to have monthly meditation in our office. We even had like a Buddha come to our office. I got banned. <laughs> because I'd sit there tapping my feet going, are we done yet? Are we done yet? My brain doesn't shut down. It doesn't work well for me. And that, the thing that I want to highlight from that is that self-care is really different to everyone. So whilst I come, you know, it could be connecting with a counsellor, could be connecting with someone else. What I do if um, I have a full day to do this presentation, there's six different types of um, self-care. You know, we have social, we have um, spiritual, we have educational, we have um, emotional, um, physical think of the other one but um, what I do is I put them up around the room and I get everyone a whole bunch of post-it notes and, and, I w and I get people to reflect on what they do for themselves in each of those six boxes you'd be surprised how hard that is really really difficult for people quite often it's things they wish they did quite often it's things that they used to do quite often it's things that they they want to do the thing is though as a team member as a parent as a cousin as a friend as a sister as a mother a father or an uncle even just for your own team here, it's really important that we model for others that it's okay to look after yourself. It's okay to look after who you are. It's okay to look after all these different parts of your life and it's going to look really different to everyone. As I said, you know, I um, went out to... And I just found it so enlightening being out in the country. But this beautiful woman there who runs that buyer bale out there, she runs the pantry for it, she said to me that she's decided that every Thursday that she's going to just stay in bed until 10 o'clock and have a cup of tea. 
and, um, and just watch some telly and she doesn't answer the phone. Now, this is a woman after the dust storm went and swept everyone's front verandas because she wanted them to come home and feel that it was nice. So she's this woman that just gives to everyone, has 10 kids. Her daughter told her she was selfish. She said to me, I told my daughter that I'm going to do this, one of her 10 kids. And she said, I'm not going to answer my phone on Thursdays till 11 o'clock, so you don't worry. I'm just going to... And um, I said, I wonder where she learnt that from. I wonder where she learnt taking a couple of hours to yourself is selfish. And she goes, me. I modelled that for her her whole life, that you don't do that. You give and give and give. And she said, and now I regret it because I watch them give and give and give. It's okay to look after ourselves. It's okay. You know, if we get our children to connect with people, talk to counsellors, why should they if you won't? So it's important to look at why should your kids go and do a team sport or your friends or whatever if you won't do it for yourself? So that's the bit that connects all of this together, that makes it all doable. Because it isn't easy having those conversations. We do it because we care. We do it because we want to give back, you know. But that is, does come at a toll. So you've got to be able to then connect it all together. Okay, so look at that. I've squished it right until one o'clock on the dot. So thank you so much. I know that I've just pumped a whole bunch of information to you in the one hour. Hopefully you take one little message from it. If anything, you know, it's around referring. Talk to um, Radian around those connections, those referrals. They will have a lot of that information as well. There's no one service that can be everything to everyone because we are just so complex as humans. Our council always says, uh, our head of um, family therapy says, the definition of a complex family is one with more than one member. <laughs> So we're part of a system, whether it be a work system, a family system or whatever that looks like. So thank you so much for taking the time out on Are You OK Day. Go and ask the question, but importantly, ask it to yourself. Am I OK? I know it sounds cheesy, but it's really important. Were there any questions for Belinda at all? If you need to head off, you're welcome to, to go. But if you wanted to ask any questions, now's the time. Because of, because of the content, if anyone has anything that they want to come up to me afterwards, I don't have a problem with that. If you want to take photos of those things that I had, please feel free. Um, also, obviously, the content, if people want to come up and share. If anything has triggered you or you're feeling stressed by anything afterwards, I'll be hanging around for a bit. So don't hesitate to grab me. I'm more than comfortable to have a chat. Awesome. Thanks, Belinda.